Amen. Amen. So I'm starting a new series that will be probably four weeks that we do this, um, unless the Lord gives me something else. And uh, next week we're going to minister on communion. Um, I, I tell people, I like it when the Lord gives me a few things in advance. It's a little easier for me. Um, I, don't, I don't necessarily count on that. Most of the time it's praying during the week to find out. But uh, I've been meditating and thinking about this for a few weeks now, about the invitations that the Lord gives us. Um, and the ones especially that we see in the life of Jesus and in invitations that he gave. We're going to pass out an outline to help you follow along. And I was thinking about this. Um how invitations that you receive, invitations that you accept can change your life. When uh, I was 11 years old, um, a Saturday morning, just woke up, my cousin Brent, um, who's in heaven now, was living with us. He shared a room with me for about three, four years. And uh, I'm just waking up on Saturday morning, not planning to do anything. And uh, he's getting ready to go to work. And he said, hey, what are you doing tonight? And I'm like, well, I'm in seventh grade. I'm not doing anything. Um, it's like nothing. He goes, do you want to do you want to go to a concert with me? And I was like, well, who is it? And I'm thinking if it's a Christian concert, it's probably going to be, you know, some lady with, you know, with a Pentecostal hairdo and a banjo or something like that. And I'm like, well, who is it? And he said, Keith Green. And I'd actually had seen the, the ad for it, um, but, the, but they were up around town. And I was like, wait, Keith Green actually plays good music. And so I said, yeah, I'll go, I'll go to Keith Green with you. And so uh, um, he said, well, I'm coming home from work and then you and I'll go. And, and David, who wasn't born yet, he was David's dad. Bill, Bill wants to come too. And so I accepted the invitation to go. Not knowing, not knowing that me saying yes to the invitation to go to a concert would also impact and change my life forever. Because, and I like to tell people this, just because you are in a Christian home, just because your dad might be a pastor, just because your, your mom might be a strong believer in a, in a prayer, a prayer does not mean that you have any relationship with the Lord. There, there are, uh, there are no, um, God has no grandchildren. We'll say it that way. God has no grandkids. He has only kids. You don't go to God through anybody else as much as the Catholics will tell you to pray to the saint because you're not as good as the saint or that's not how God operates. That's right. You go to God for you through him, to him. And even though I'd heard the gospel preached, I'd, I'd seen it in my household, I'd seen the answered prayers. Um, it wasn't real to me. And the other side, the other side of the, the, the equation that night which I tell people is that Keith, Keith Green most likely um, he would still have a following today but his message would not be popular because it's not, uh, it's not a popular message of the day he didn't preach just make a decision to come to Christ well just make a decision you'll be a Christian he didn't say that he got up and he said listen if you make the decision to come to Christ I'm telling you right now you give everything and all that you are to him amen and, and from this day forth, you're sold out. Don't come and make this decision and not plan on, on going to the world. If you come to Christ, you are, you are a missionary. If you come to Christ, you are a minister of the gospel. If you come to Christ, you're a preacher. Whether you ever stand behind the pulpit or not, everything you have is his from the day you, you make this decision. Don't make this decision and just add this to your life. He actually made fun of people in the, in that, that night. He goes, a lot of people think they come to Christ, they, they clap their hands and do all, he's, he, he, he actually almost was, dis, I mean, almost was disrespectful. So people come to Jesus and they act like this. And he goes, they're not Christians. I said, his message wasn't popular. He said, when you come to Jesus, you make a decision. And so, and, and he said, don't come seek me out like I'm some great person. He goes, I'm just doing what the gospel said. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He goes, I'm no, I'm no better than you. And he goes, I've got strengths and weaknesses in my life. And he said, the one thing I've done is I left everything and I've given everything. And I'm, I'll do everything I can to preach this gospel till I go to heaven. Amen. And he, he did go to heaven young, but he did it. He died on a mission trip. Um, he gave everything he had. And so he made the, he made the statement, though. He said, when, when you go home tonight, don't do this unless you are ready, unless you are ready to give everything. I don't want you just to come. To, I don't want you just make an easy decision. Make a decision to follow. Make a decision that you will give everything. And I'm, I'm not taking an offering, so don't get nervous. And he wasn't taking an offer. He wasn't taking an offering either. He's talking about giving your heart, giving your life. Given everything and, and being willing to do whatever the Lord asks you to do. 
And a lot, you know, some people, some people who claim to be Christians won't do what the Lord asks them to do. Now, I came to Jesus, and I'll, I'll get back to my message. Don't worry, it's a short outline this morning. So, everybody take a deep breath. Um, I came to Jesus, but, but I still, I, I still, even going to Bible school, I still didn't fully give everything. I had an argument with the Lord. My dad and I drove down to Christ for the Nations. I had an argument with the Lord going down the Columbia River Gorge. I'm not going to Africa. I'm not going to Asia. I'm not going to South America. I'm only preaching in the U.S. I won't go into all the world. That was the argument I had. And uh, it's a mistake to have that argument when you're going to Christ for the nations. It's a mission school, first and foremost. And how many of you know every, every day that I was there was torment to me because all I heard every day was missions, 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 missions. They'd, we have a meeting on our floor, so the dorm floor will get together. What are we doing? We're taking a missions offering. <laughs> We're getting missions all the time. And, and so finally, Shell and I, were in, we got engaged. And I'm, actually, we got engaged. And finally, I just, we actually, I saw Wayne Myers, another missionary who came to Christ for the Nations every year. He's 90-something now. He's one of Terry Mize's uh, fathers in the faith. Um, and I heard Wayne preach on missions again. And he said, be willing to say yes to God. And uh, so that night I said, yes. I said, okay, God, I'll go. So I started trying to go to the mission field. And it, it, it's amazing what happens when you just say yes to God. I, I tried to, I actually signed up to go on a mission trip, going to South Africa, the place I said I'd never go. And uh, yeah, I tried to go. The Lord stopped me that trip. So I never called you to go to, I never called you to go there. I just need you to be willing to do whatever I ask. Now I still listen to him and we have a South African on our church. That never stopped my prayer for South Africa, my desire to go. I still have it on my heart, I want to go. But it wasn't that wasn't the time and nothing went right when you're trying to go someplace out of the will of God. I had to be willing though. And so until I was willing, um, until I was willing, what I was unwilling to do was before my face all the time. It's amazing. When I found out, when I, it was about four years. I kept trying. I kept trying to go different places. And I kept bumping into into issues all the time. And the Lord finally told me, "So I never called you to go. I called you to plan and pastor a church." So, funny thing was, Shelly's not in the room. She's helping right now with the children. Funny thing was, when I said yes to pastor, and Shelly said, "Wait a second, I didn't sign up for that." She goes, "You said you're going to be a missionary." I said, "Well, that's what I thought." She goes, "Well, I didn't sign up to be a pastor's wife. That's the last thing I want to do." Like, well, you got to say yes too. We, we both had to say yes to some different things. How many of you know Shelly is gifted and grace to be a pastor's wife? So, so anyway, Jesus, one invitation, and we'll say this first. Jesus gives us a number of invitations. One invitation changed my life. Jesus, through the Gospels, gave multiple invitations. And this is, this is just the intro this morning. Doesn't mean it's not impactful. Doesn't mean it won't be helpful. But I've got a few other ones coming down the, the road that I'm excited about. But we've got to start where we start. Are out there? Let's look in John chapter 1 this morning. This is verse 35 through 39. It says, And again the next day John stood with two of his disciples, so that's John the Baptist, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. How'd you like this? John was such a good preacher and teacher that when he saw Jesus, his two disciples heard him speak and they left John and started following Jesus. Oh, well, where are you guys going? Well, you just said that he's the one we've been talking about. See ya. Anyway. You gotta, watch, you gotta watch how you teach people. You teach them too good, they take them. <laughs> the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned. I do like Jesus, it doesn't even say what he's doing. Jesus is taking a walk and all of a sudden he looks back and there's a couple guys following him. He says to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, or translated teacher, where are you staying? And this is the first invitation. He said to them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. The first invitation that we see Jesus giving is come and see. God gives you an invitation. He said, come and see. And he asked him, what are you seeking? Let me say this. I... Just because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, just because I'm a new creature, just because I've walked with God now from that night that I told you about in 1979 when I gave my heart to Christ, doesn't mean that I've stopped seeking Him. 
I'm seeking him actually more passionate today than I did back, back when I came to Christ. The, the invitation to come and see and what are you seeking hasn't changed for you if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, he's telling you, come check me out. God never gets tired of the seeking. Do you know not, God's not bothered with questions? He's not bothered with questions. He's bothered by unbelief. He doesn't appreciate those trying to trap him. You can also see this in the scripture. But legitimate heartfelt questions, God's good with. And he, he loves to spend time with seekers, those who are truly seeking after him. Proverbs 25 2 says this it's the glory of God to conceal a matter but the glory of kings is to search it out or to search out a matter God loves it especially if you don't understand something rather than being mad that you seek him harder you press in more so this over over the last over the last couple of years there's three or four big things that have happened that made me question one of them was, was the man that went to heaven that I didn't feel was supposed to go. Another one was our building, our building transition. Both of them, instead of, there was opportunity during both of those things to get mad at God or to get frustrated. And, it's, and I made the decision, I'm not getting mad, I'm not getting frustrated, I'm going to press in even more. I'm going to press into him harder. I'm going to press in, because um, I know there's answers out there. And I, and, and I made this decision years ago. But it, it will still come and it'll, you'll still have this temptation. But when things don't go as, as you see fit, I made a decision years ago, I'm not going to blame God. If there's a problem, I'm not going to blame Him. I'm going to figure it's on my end somewhere. Yeah. Now the temptation will still cause, because when you step out and you are doing your best to obey and then things don't go like you think they're supposed to, the temptation is, why did God lead me to do this? Why did you ask me to, why did I do this? And the temptation is to turn back and look and get mad at God. But I, I kept saying to myself during some of this, Lord, I know it's not you. There's wisdom. Lord, I know it's not you. Show me, show me, show me where I missed it. Show me what happened. To say that does not mean you're in sin. Now, we, we understand sin's missing the mark, but, but if something happens that doesn't work out right, you, you may have had the right heart, but you may not have had all the understanding that you needed at that point. You may have gotten involved in a battle that was just bigger than where your faith was at. And that doesn't mean you quit or give up. It means that you grew through that and you'll grow for the next one. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I liken this to the analogy. Um, you might be facing a battle that's the equivalent of a thousand pound rock. And you push and push and push as hard as you can. You push and push and push as hard as you can and it doesn't move. And you, you might think, well, I might as well give up. Well, no. What's going to happen is that you might show up against a 200 pound or a 500 pound rock and you push that and all of a sudden it moves. You may not have been able to move the bigger one, but by, because of your persistence and your pushing as hard as you can, when the, when the next one shows up, all of a sudden you well, well, that wasn't as hard as I thought it was. Just because you didn't quit. And God will give, God will give you insight. God will give you answers. But they're, they're not, we've already said this the last few weeks, they're not for the casual. They're for those who, who seek out and search out a matter. So if you've got questions, God doesn't have a problem with the questions. He has a, he has a, he has a problem. He, has a pro, he does have an issue. You can see this in the life of Jesus. When people try and trap him, or people try and corner him, Jesus never, Jesus never got trapped. And your Heavenly Father won't. But God uh, loves it. When we come with a humble heart, He'll reveal Himself to us. That's never changed. Every person that came to Jesus with a humble heart, Jesus had answers for. He loved to spend time with them. And, and John chapter 3, Nicholas showed up at night. He was afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue. And, but he wanted to spend time with Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't... You all understand that was the first time Nick and Knight was mentioned in the world, but uh, that was a joke. Um, but but anyway, uh, Jesus didn't bother the Nichols came and maybe woke him up and hung out in the evening. He just he just talked to them about being born again. And Mr. Nicholas didn't understand what that meant. So what did Jesus do? He kept explaining it to him. 
Because Nicholas had a heart. He had a heart to, to learn and to understand. He didn't say, listen, it's time for bed. I don't know, just spent time with him. When we come with a humble heart, God reveals himself to us. I'm going to kind of change gears a little bit here. But most of the time, most of the time, this invitation comes through other people, though, especially in the day that we live. Most of the time, this invitation is going to come from you and me inviting somebody else. Anybody smell bacon besides me? It's making me, it's making me hungry. As God's people, as God's people, we need to invite others. Let's look at the next passage of scripture here. This is, this is just connected. It says that one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated the, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Everybody say, Follow me. Follow. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also all the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered, said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael's mind went. <laughs> and Nathanael said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. How many of you know that Nathaniel did see greater things than those? The next invitation, the first one we had was uh, come and see. The next uh, second invitation is follow me. Now, I did years ago, I did a whole series on follow me and attempted to do it again. We might do it in the days ahead. But the second invitation is follow me. He, he, he told them to follow him. Do you ever play... I haven't done it probably since first grade, but kindergarten, first grade, we played a game called Follow the Leader. You know, and usually you see one person run around on the playground and a line of people following him. The natural response to following Jesus should be like that is to bring some, is to want to bring somebody else. There should be a natural, there should be a natural response of when you find out how good something is, you want to take somebody. Yeah. You know, and number one for me that I like to take people on a journey is the journey with, with my Lord. Those of you who know me know that, that I like good food. You know what I also like to do? I like to take people to good places to eat or tell them where to go. I think my wife gets tired of uh, me being the food dictionary for everybody. <laughs> um, we were sitting at the airport on, on this last trip, and uh, this guy asked, asked Mel where we were going, and she, she told him, and he's, he's like, well, have you, he said, have you checked out Yelp? And she goes, that's what my dad does. <laughs> she goes, he does that all the time. And he goes, oh, really? And so we ended up talking about, um, talking about food for a few minutes there before. The, they were just there for a few minutes before they went. I like to tell people about good things in my life. Number one is my Savior. You know, but, you know, if you guys are going on a trip, you can ask me, have you ever been such and such place? And if I've been there, I can tell you where to go get a good meal at. Most of the time a good burger, but also good meals outside, outside of that as well. The natural indication to follow in Jesus should be to bring someone else. So, so everybody say this first, no condemnation. Right, right now, whenever we talk about soul winning, people get condemned. I heard, this is a funny story. I heard one pastor years ago, it's not funny for him, but it is for me. 
he got up and told his church, he said, if, you don't, if everybody here doesn't bring somebody next week, I don't want you to come back. And he lost half his congregation. So we're, we're not putting pressure on you. I thought it was, that. I was like, I was smart. I learned from other people's mistakes. You don't do that. Um, but uh, he, then he was, the guy was devastated. And he was like, well, what happened? Well, you told them not to come back. What do you think they're going to do? I thought we'd just double our church in attendance. Well, no, everybody that couldn't bring somebody decided that you didn't want them there anymore, so they didn't show up. Uh, they found the church down the road that didn't care. So no condemnation, but I, there's six, six biblical ways that we see people um, bring people to Jesus or lead them to Christ. And the number, the one, number one most important thing, and I'm going to remind you this over and over, the number one most important thing when, when sharing the gospel is to be led by the Spirit of God. Um, and it, we're going to go over why that's important in a couple moments here. These are six different ways that we see people come to Christ. Six different ways to give the invitation. And the number one is first is this was Peter. And we'll call this one confrontational. How many of you know that Peter was confrontational? Peter, on the night Jesus was betrayed, cut off the servant of the high priest's ear. His name was Malchus. Cut his ear off, defending Jesus. He was a little confrontational. But the, the cool thing was, after, after all that, Peter backslidden all this, the day of Pentecost comes, he's full of the Holy Spirit. They go out on the street, they're speaking in tongues. People come up and they're like, what is this? And Peter preaches a bold gospel. And then he makes this statement, this is a little confrontational here. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, the very people that crucified Jesus are behind it or right there listening to him. He goes, the one, the one you crucified, he's Lord in Christ. That's a little confrontational. And a couple thousand people come to Jesus. Give their hearts to the Lord. And he has another confrontational message a few chapters later, and another few thousand people come to Jesus. They, they have 5,000 people in the church because of this. There are some people, we'll say this, there are some people that will only come to Jesus when someone is bold and gets in their face. But remember, if, if this is your personality, remember this, that every problem, if you're a hammer, every problem is not a nail. <laughs> And every person, every person, you might be bold like that, but you better be led because you will actually turn some people off and run them away from the gospel if you try and deal with every single person the same way. You need to be led. Yeah. And, and I've seen this more than once where, well, I just always lead people that way. Well, some people are not going to respond to that, but some people only will. The answer to 101 questions is be led. Yeah. There's, there's times when I've, when I've shared the gospel with people, not here, but there's times that I'm at different places where you're sharing the gospel that you want to get bold. And, 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 and boldness doesn't mean necessarily allowed, but you want to be confronted, I'll say that. And you just have the Spirit of God check, don't do it. Don't do it. And I'm not saying not to share, but, but you, you find a way to, to, to talk in a different manner than just being, listen, you need to repent. Is there a time to tell people you need to repent? Yeah, right here. We just see one with, with Peter. There's times that confrontational is the way that's going to lead people into Jesus. But one of the greatest messages I've ever heard in my entire life was preached by Rich Wilkerson, who was an assembly. He's a pastor now in South Florida, but he was an Assemblies of God evangelist for many years that tra traveled this area a lot. And uh, he was at bi the Bible school I went to, and he preached a message on AIDS, abortion, and anarchy. And you could feel the flames of hell singeing your clothes while you're listening to him. And I'm not joking. I was, I was sold out on fire for God, no sin in my life. And I was convicted. I was, I was ready to run to the altar myself. And it wasn't condemnation. Um, matter of fact, it was so hot that I, saw, I looked across and I saw two guys that were friends of mine that, that weren't in school. They'd finished, but they were both backslidden. And uh, I was sitting there laughing because they're hearing this message. And, and at the end, Rich had the, he did this altar call at the end of the message. He goes, everybody stand up right now. Will stood up and he goes, if you're right with God, turn around and face the back this moment. And he goes, all right, now I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to you. You're looking at me right now. It's like, whoa. And I look over, and my two friends are both named Mike. Mike and Mike were over there. I look over, and they're not in the room. 
And so I went out back and I was like, what are you doing? And they're like, got too hot in there. They said, they said man, and they were like, we're both glad we left before that altar call because we wouldn't, we, we wouldn't have been able to turn around. And we, we ditched it about three quarters of the way through. We couldn't take it. The conviction was so strong on them. Now, neither one of them serving God today. Still both graduates of Bible school, both backslidden. Um, but there was, there was about eight people. And one of the guys that went down that night, I knew he was a, he was a mess. He was in school, and he went down. His life was changed forever that night, just because someone was bold enough to get right in his face during a service. Um, confrontational is the first. Time. If this is you, don't be afraid. But, be, but, but definitely, don't be afraid to step out and be bold. But make sure you listen to the Holy Spirit, because everybody doesn't respond this way. But but there are some that only will respond this way too. Next one, we we'll call this intellectual. This is the Apostle Paul, and, and we'll, we'll give some clarification on this. Paul in, in Acts 17, it says, When they had passed through Am, Am, uh, Amphipolis, and Apo I hadn't practiced the names before I got here. I just remember they're going to Thessalonica when I put this down. Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. I didn't see any of you doing any better. So, no season. I'm just laughing. <clears throat> then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Jesus had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. Now, th this is not an argument. And this is not a debate, but some people do get reached on the intellectual level. How many have read the book The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel? Now, first of all, if you've never read it, read it. It's a phenomenal book. I read it after being a Christian for over 20, for about 20 years. It still changed my life because he, he writes things on an intellectual level that are, that are so powerful. And the arguments about why Jesus, you know, lived, died and was resurrected on an intellectual level makes sense. As, an athe as a previous atheist of someone who came to Christ because of what he saw in his wife's life, he came to Jesus himself. But he did due diligence. Um, and some people will, will only be reached this way. Now, once again, I, I, like, I like talking to people. I, I love showing the gospel. The, the, the challenge I have and the challenge we must remember is that we're not trying to win an argument. Because you can win an argument and lose a person. Uh, we're, not trying to, we're not trying to win a debate. We're trying to share the gospel. And so uh, being led on, on how we, obviously Paul here was led in a way that he kept discussing and demonstrating who Jesus was, where a number of people came to Jesus. I love it, where it says, a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. Not a few means a lot. He made a great impact in Thessalonica just by being willing to discuss and share the gospel. You guys with me this morning? Yes. Next one. We'll call this one testimonial. Now this, this might be, I, I say this frequently, this might be my favorite miracle that Jesus ever did out of, of John chapter 9. This is, this is the story of the man who was born blind. And uh, the disciples asked Jesus, they said, who sinned? He or his parents? And he said, neither. Well, this didn't happen because of sin. But he said, this is, this is done to the kingdom of God will be demonstrated to you. And then he, Jesus spits on the ground, makes mud, puts it on the blind man's eyes. And then he says, go off to Siloam, wash your eyes off. And so he does it. And it's the Sabbath day. So everybody, all the Pharisees and the religious people got all mad because Jesus healed on the Sabbath day. Jesus did this a few times, which he just liked to needle the religious, you know, the religious people a little bit. Saying the Sabbath is to be set free, not to, not to be in bondage. You're, you're to get turned loose, not to be bound up. Um, I heard somebody snicker. That was not meant that way. So, anyway, if you missed it, that's fine. Let it go. So, anyway, after the man gets healed, the Pharisees pull him back. And they start harassing him. They, they question him, how did, how did this happen? Who did this? And then uh, they pull on his parents. The parents are afraid of, the, of getting kicked out of church. So they're like, is this your son? They're like, yeah. And they're like, well, how did he get healed? They're like, well, he was of agent. You ask him. 
They're like, well, see, yeah, we don't know what happened. We know he was born blind, but here he is now. And they're like, you ask him, he's of age. So they ask him again. And this man didn't have all the answers. How do you like it? He's sitting there by the side of the road one day. Someone wipes mud on his eyes, go wash off, and all of a sudden his eyes are opened. He doesn't know what happened. He has no doctrine. He doesn't know even who Jesus is at this point. And so they're like, ask him again. He goes, <laughs> he's like, why are you asking me again? You already asked me this. He goes, do you guys want to be his disciple too? And they, they blow a gasket. That makes him really mad. And this will, will remind you this morning. You may not have all the answers. You may not be able to reason like Paul did. You may not be able to preach like Peter did. But you can do what this man did. I don't have all the answers. I don't know. I don't even know what happened to me. <laughs> Let's read the whole section that, that we put on the outline here. Verse 24 says, So then they called the man who was blind and said, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I know, that I was blind, but now I see. You may not have all the answers, but nobody, nobody, nobody can steal your testimony. And they, might, they, they might be able to, to, to argue and, and fuss about certain stuff. But the bottom line is this, once I was blind, now I see. I heard one man, um, he, was, he was from California, but he moved up here to Oregon to live in a drug commune, and he got born again. And uh, he, he went back home, and he's in the ministry today, and has uh, married with kids. And he said, my kids got so tired of me, because every time we drive by a graveyard, I point out, say, kids, that, that we already know, we heard, that should be you, you should be dead right now. But God saved you. God was merciful and saved you. And he said, I want my kids to know my testimony so well. And he goes, they do. They're fed up with hearing it. But I tell them all the time, that should be me out there. But God saved me. Listen, you may not have all the doctrine down, but you have a Savior, and you're alive today, and your testimony is something that can never get stolen from you. And if that's all you've got to share the gospel, that's enough. Next one, relational. I think this is, this is another very cool miracle of Jesus in Mark 5. Jesus shows up at Decapolis, and a demon-possessed man shows up. And scripturally speaking, this was the most demon-possessed person that we see in the Bible. He had a legion of demons. They said they couldn't even keep him in jail. He'd break off the chains. He'd break out. He scared the tar out of everybody in the region. They're all scared of him. Um, if you if you grew up where I did in Forest Grove, just a few miles to the west, everybody was afraid of a certain lady that lived in town there, outside of town. Her name was Rita Hesacker. And Rita, Rita, Rita had this happened to us one time. Uh, my sister met, was with me, and she met us on a bus, and she goes, "Give me a ride home." And Melinda was trying to be nice, and so we spent the afternoon with her, gave her a ride home. But we found out um, that Rita used to wait on the, on, the, on the corners of streets in Forest Grove, and if you, pulled up, if you pulled up next to her, she would just open your car door and get in and say, take me wherever she wanted to go. Sometimes it would take me to the hospital, sometimes it would take me to Safeway or Tradewell, take me, to, take me home, take me to Scotty's. We saw her at Scotty's more than once. And I said, hey, Dad, that's the lady. One time we saw her, I said, Dad, that's the lady. Don't talk to her. I'm not giving her another ride home. You know, um, she was messed up though and uh, had more than one talked with her when, when I was in high school she, she passed away a number of years ago but there was a reputation and it was funny because I, I thought we were the only people that knew her but everybody, in, everybody I knew in high school from Forest Grove knew about Rita Hesacker everybody had a Rita story well this guy had a story way bigger than Rita Hesacker's story Everybody was terrified of this guy. They couldn't keep him in jail. He'd break out. Jesus shows up, and he just runs down. He wants to get set free so bad. Jesus casts the devil out of him. And Jesus is about to, he, he gets, it says, Jesus, he gets in the boat, and he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him. He didn't, get, he didn't get the invitation to come, but he did get an invitation to do something. He said to him, go home to your friends. So go home means your family, to your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he, began, or he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. 
if you go look, and, and I, I put the verse in, in Mark 7, 33, Jesus went back to Decapolis, and it says, and a great multitude showed up to hear him. And there many miracles. Another, another demonized person was set free. Why? He went back and just went to his family and went to his friends and said, I've been set free. I had an encounter with Jesus. And they're like, wait a second. Weren't you just clawing yourself and cutting yourself and screaming and howling at the moon and doing all that crazy stuff? Yeah, but I had an encounter. I've been set free. Oh, we'd like, we'd like to know your Savior. I heard a story of a girl that had been on the rodeo. She was a Native American down, I don't remember which tribe, down in, in southern Oregon. And uh, her mom was a believer, but the rest of the family was, was messed up. And she ended up, she'd, she was a young lady, been on the rodeo, but she'd drunk so much, she'd poisoned her, her, her insides, and her insides were just a mess. And she went to the doctor, and the doctor's like, well, you can't eat, you can't drink, you can't do anything, you're going to die soon. And so she, she went home and told her, her mom, who was a believer, she said, doctor, I can't eat, drink, do anything, I'm going to die. She goes, well, come to church with me. She goes, I'm not going to church. She goes, I'm, I'm a mess. No, just come to church, just come and see. Come one night. And there was, a, there was a traveling minister there from out of town. So she went into church and sat down there, and, and he preached and, and gave an altar call, and she went down front. I mean, you know, you, you've been given a couple weeks to live. You have nothing to lose. So she went down front, and he prayed for her, and he said, I believe that God wants to heal you. He prayed for her. She didn't feel anything. So the, the minister said, don't leave. Don't leave the service. Just stay right here. Um, I want to talk to you afterwards. The service ends and he goes, Pastor and I and, and the group, we're going to take you out and buy you hamburgers. She goes, I can't eat. I can't keep anything down. My insides are a mess. He goes, the Lord told me to buy you a hamburger. So they went out to eat. He ordered her, he said, I get her a greasy cheeseburger. Is what the, the, the guy says. So they order a cheeseburger, it comes down. She goes, I can't eat this. And he goes, just do it. So she reaches up, takes a bite. She says, oh, that tastes good. And she swallows it. And she sat there for a few minutes. Nothing came back up. So took another bite, took another bite, took another bite. She ended up devouring and ordered another one because <laughs> she hadn't eaten. And uh, they didn't think anything about it. She left. Service comes the next night. Now the church is only is a little tiny country church outside of Klamath Falls from the, the way I understood the story. <clears throat> the next night, the pastor shows up and there's no seats. It's full. And it's full of her whole tribe. Everybody came. The evangelist shows up and he goes, where do all these people come from? He goes, Rose goes, I invited them. And the minister preached, gave an altar call. The whole tribe came to Jesus. One service from one notable miracle taking place. There's part, of, there's part of just going back and reaching those that you're around. And many of us look... We look outside of our family, but remember, the, your family is your number one, your number one goal. And, and, and some of you are believing, and some of them, you know I'm agreeing with you for some of them, but, but don't give up on your family. Don't give up, don't give up, don't quit. Um, we're believing. They're coming in. But many of us, if we would just reach our family, we change the world around us. So, and this is just relational. Um, and I don't mean this in a negative. I don't mean that in a negative sense. The relational part of sharing the gospel is huge. The other, the other side of it, not just your family. Who do you know in your life that's that's not that's not a Christian? And what do they know about the God that you serve? And we already started no condemnation. Everybody, everybody take a deep breath, no condemnation. But who do you know that's not a believer? And do they know the God that you serve? Do they know you're a believer? Or do they just know that you're a nice guy or a nice girl? Who do you know? Because it makes a difference. When we, when we started this ministry, you know who came to, you know who came to church was people that, that Shelley and I got to know, people that, that the Lemons and the Dudex got to know when we started out here in Forest Grove. You get to know them, know that you have a real relationship with the real God, that we walk by faith, not by sight. <clears throat> and it's amazing to see what, what God will do. 
If people see that you have a real faith and you're a real walk. I'm going to take a little parenthesis right here. The other day, I was, I was, maybe it was just yesterday, I was driving down the road though, I think it was yesterday. And I, I remembered a miracle that God did when we were back in Tennessee. And I started thinking about stuff. Did you know that as you go through life, you probably have forgotten, if you've been a Christian more than a few years, you've probably forgotten more answers to prayer than you realize. Yeah. Yeah. I started thinking about some of the things that God has done, and, and the Lord quickened me. He said, you need to make sure you write these things down and don't forget what I've done. Because a lot of it happens and you just chalk it up as life. And you go on and you move to the next challenge. And just go on and move to the next challenge. Forgetting that each and every one is significant. Each and every one, God does something different. I heard, I heard somebody say this week, as uh, people that get used to seeing the things of God, you know what's easy to do is to start judging, judging miracles on the spectacularness or the, you know, the bigness of it. And fail to appreciate that every time God moves, it's, it's something to be in awe of. Every time, every answer to prayer is something giant that we should make a marker of. Because that's how people missed it in Jesus' life and ministry. They, they, in, in Luke 4, I believe it's Luke 4, when Jesus was sharing, and they said they were amazed at his wisdom. They're amazed at what was going on. And then they started to say, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. This is Joseph's kid. Who does he think he is? And they started, they started taking the supernatural revelation and they just started to, to discount it. Whenever God moves on your behalf, don't judge it as compared to spectacular what God's done for somebody else or even what he's done in your own life. Be thankful for what he's done. Be thankful each and every step of the way. Appreciate it because what we appreciate, when we appreciate it, we'll get more. And let me just say... Some of you have known for a long time, some of you just a short time. But those of you that I've known for a number of years, I've seen, I've seen more miracles in, in so many of your lives than I, can even, than I can even put down on paper right now. People, people around you need to know the God who did them. Doesn't mean you need to, to be, it doesn't mean you need to go and be Peter, but don't be afraid to talk about what God's done in your life. Especially to those who, who you love and you're praying for. Yes, Amen. Amen. Last one, we'll call, we'll call this one invitational. <clears throat> That's where Jesus it says in, in John 4 that he's, he's going one direction, but he had to go through Samaria. Samaria was the, the, the area of where Jewish people mixed with, with the world. And they were the Samaritans were not a well thought of people. And Jesus stopped on the way. And he, he goes to a well and he has a, a great dialogue with the lady here. <clears throat> and it says, and so he, he shares with this, this is the lady too, where uh, Jesus says, why don't you get your husband? And she goes, I don't have a husband. He goes, yeah, you're right. You've had five and the guy, the sixth one that you're living with, you're shacking up with right now. He's not your husband. She's like, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> I just, I love how people come to Jesus and they think they're going to snowball him. You know, they're, they're going to bluff their way. Jesus didn't get bluffed. He didn't get tricked. He still does not with you and me. We, we try and tell him stuff, but he sees our heart. He knows exactly what's going on. Um, but after this dialogue, it says, The woman left her water pot, went, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come and see a man. we we'll see this again. Come and see. Come and see a man that's, that told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. And then verse 42 says this, And they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. The invitational, the invitational side of this, and this is many people, sometimes all you need to do is just invite somebody. Where do you get it? We're talking about bumper stickers. What's that bumper sticker mean? Come and see. What's that shirt mean? Come and see. You know, we'll get ready for this. Sometimes, if you have someone that you've been praying for, 
it would be a good thing to ask them to say, hey, why don't you come to church with me and I'll take you out to dinner at your choice afterwards. Be prepared for them to stay someplace more expensive than you feel like paying. <laughs> But is it worth it to see them come to Christ? Yes. Is, is what you receive here of, of enough value to think this will really help somebody else? Be willing to invest. Invite. Invitation. It's not, you, don't have to, you don't have to be a preacher to do this. Come with me. I, I heard, I heard a, a pastor in another city, he talked about this, that a... Uh, he said a guy came to his church and he was sitting there and he came for like six months and he said one day after six months, he goes, this guy every service come out, shake my hand on the back and say, Pastor, that was a powerful message this morning. He said after six months I give an altar call and he gets up and comes down front. I'm like, what are you doing here? He goes, well, I wasn't a Christian. <clears throat> You're not a Christian? No. He goes, we've well, been here for six months. He goes, yeah, that guy over there invited me. So I came and he goes, I liked it. So I came back. I wasn't a, I'm not a believer. He goes, I've been listening for six months. Today I made a decision. Just, just based on, just based on somebody inviting them, and you know they might turn you down. That's okay. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's fine as long as the invitation is out there. So, well, you don't do it. Just tell me when you want to go. The invitation is still standing. You don't have to pressure people. But it's amazing. It's amazing if you'll just invite somebody. How many people will go and, and just, just, yeah, I'll do that last one today is serving the reason the reason we're, we're starting all the the acts of service here because this is a huge part of, of reaching people for the gospel it's an old adage and it's very cliched but people really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care and that's that's very true <laughs> um, the reason we made the outreach t-shirts not because we're trying to show off we want people to know that we serve a god we want people to know the reason we're doing these things is because of him who saved us. Um, there's a lady, uh, her surname or her, her given name was Tabitha, but they called her Dorcas. I don't think that was a compliment. No, I mean, in our day and age, it's not a compliment to say that. In that age, it was a compliment for her. Um, they, they obviously were not using the word dork, you know, in their, in their generation. But she passed away and Peter shows up. And it says that all the widows stood by and weeping, showing the tunics and the garments which she had made while she was with them. This lady lived her life in a way where she invested in, in everybody in that area. Now, she was raised from the dead just because of her good works. Because the church said this, we can't afford to have her not here with us. The whole reason, the whole reason that they got Peter to, to come pray for her and get a raise with it is because of how much she did in the church. Now, uh, I remember the first time I read that and it, and it made, you know, I comprehended it. I was just in the church and the, and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, would they even notice if you were here or not if you died? They all noticed. And they're like, we can't live without her. Well, obviously he can. Nobody, nobody's that important. But what, what motivated them to have Peter pray for her was how, how her acts of service were in the church, how important that was. We want our community to know how much we not just love God, but love them. We want to invest in our community as well. Um, and you don't, you don't have to be a preacher every time you do something wonderful or do something nice for somebody. There are times, and, and every once in a while, I don't, I don't do but if I get quick into the Lord, and I don't necessarily, you don't have to tell them, randomly buy a coffee for someone. If you're going through Dutch Bros or Starbucks, do the act of service. Hey, I just want what are they, I have done. didn't know the people, didn't recognize them, just felt led to do it. Tell them I said, have a great day, I just paid for their coffee. Just do something nice for people. But so, uh, Dutch Sheets years ago heard him tell the story. Um, he uh, he said, and I don't remember if it was a church he was pastoring, if it was a church that the pastor was a friend of his. There's a lady in, in the church, single lady. I think she was a widow. She's in her you know late mid to late seventies. Somehow she would always figure out when, by the spirit of God, when someone was sick on her street where she lived. And so every time the people say they get the flu or a cold and all of a sudden she's at their door and knock on the door, here I made some soup for you. And the, the people on the street were like, and it wasn't, it wasn't just, 
Okay, it wasn't bad soup, it was good soup. So people actually really appreciated it. <laughs> They'd be like, wow, thank God. And they would, they would just, uh, appre and people started looking forward to actually, if they got a, the, the household got sick, they're like, she's going to show up with soup again. They never knew how she found out what happened, but th this went on for like seven or eight years. And she made, she had, uh, invariably had, had made soup for every single person on her street. And then one day on Mother's Day, the week before Mother's Day, she just went and knocked on every door. Every house that she'd given soup to, she knocked on the door and she goes, you know, I'm a widow. You know, I, I don't ask for much, but it's Mother's Day. I just wonder if you could come to church with me this week. Every single house on her street went to church with her. When the pastor showed up, there were, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of, of an extra hundred people in service that Sunday. And he's like, where did you come from? And she's sitting there on the end of the row. And they're like, why did you come? And every single person, because she made us really good soup. And, and, and actually five families, five whole families gave their hearts to Christ that Sunday. Made an impact just because she blessed people. Just because you bless people, you don't have to. Be, you don't have to be the greatest preacher, but you've got a testimony. You can serve somebody else. You can invite somebody. You might. You might be be one of those ones who can be bold like Peter, but you don't have to be. If you are, that's great. You might. You might be an intellectual that, that loves to sit and discuss the gospel, but if you're not, you don't have to be. You can. You can tell somebody come and see. Once again, there's no condemnation on, there's no condemnation, but let's ask the Lord this morning, Father, help us, help us find those who need you. One of the things we want to pray, and one of the things that I pray and that we should all pray, Lord, bring me across people's paths who are, who are, are calling out for you, that are seekers of truth, and that are close to eternity. Because God will lead you and guide your steps in ways that you never dreamed possible, if you'll just listen. And all you have to do is to come and see. Amen? Amen? Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for the invitations that you've given us as your children. The invitation that we see through Jesus' life and ministry to come and see, to follow you, and that you love to spend time with seekers, those who are hungry for you. Now, now Father, I, I, first and foremost, if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you've never become a believer, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. If there is any other way, our Heavenly Father was demented and deranged for punishing Jesus like he did for us. But there is no other way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you've never made him Lord, you've never made that decision, today's your day. If you've been walked away from God to come back, it's just a decision. Lord, I messed up. I'm turning around. I'm coming back home this morning. Understand this. The Father is waiting and he loves you so much. Lastly, this morning, I'm not given a call, but I just want to ask you to make a commitment. Lord, open my eyes to those around me. Open my eyes to those around me. Lead me across people whose paths are close to you.